Aloha, my kako. Welcome back to Energy Justice in Hawaii, uh, the uh, bi-weekly, uh, every two weeks definition of bi-weekly um, uh, video interview that we have here um, on Think Tech Hawaii. Today, we're going to be talking about community ownership and circular economies with special guest Ikaika Hussey. Um, Ikaika is a good friend of mine and fellow uh, conspirator in the community-owned clean energy space. Um, and uh, he is also the uh, president of Hawaii Federated Industries. Um, I might have sure. gotten my title wrong, um, but uh, we're really glad to have him here today. Um, Ikaika, can uh, we start the conversation maybe with a little bit of background on uh, you and Hawaii Federated Industries, and uh, correct me if I got your title wrong, also. Oh, that's great. Yeah, thank you so much for having me, Ali, and uh, aloha kako. Uh, Ikea Manawa, Okahola Elua, Ikea Okapo, um, Iowa, Uma, Iceland, so um, Nui Ko Hao Hao, yeah, Hawaii. Uh, I'm not sure what time it is back home, maybe 4 p.m. Is that right? Okay, all right. Um, Yes, yeah, so I, you know, I'm from Hawaii. I just happen to be in a very different part of the world at the, at the moment. Uh, I'm, I live in Kalihi Valley. My background is in community organizing, uh, labor organizing. And, you know, a few years ago, um, my, my wife, who most recently was at the Sierra Club, she came home from a talk that Bill McKibben had given her or that had given. And um, she, she was sharing that in, in the talk, Bill McKibben said that, you know, climate is different from every other issue, from any other issue that I had ever worked on, sovereignty, um, you know, decolonization sort of stuff. And, you know, it's, it's that it's an issue that has a, a deadline. And we've, you know, over the last couple of years, I think we've all come to realize that, that really climate is, is the big job of this decade. And so that's why I decided to kind of pivot my own personal energies and and my own mission um, towards addressing as much as I can, just as a, as a person, um, the, the climate issue for our people in Hawaii, but also thinking about how Hawaii can really lead the world in, in addressing um, some of the, the key questions, you know, like community ownership, circularity, those kind of things. Awesome. Um, and uh, thank you so much for being awake at uh, two in the morning, uh, your time to be with us. Um, uh, just for our audience who's not as familiar with uh, the awesome kind of uh, range of, of projects that uh, Hawaii Federated Industries is uh, working on, can you give us a kind of a sample of uh, what projects, maybe without any uh, super top secret specifics that you guys? No, it's, it's okay. Yeah. We, um, I, I like sort of an open source ethic. Uh, so, you know, we, 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 we we publish all this stuff on our own website, hawaii.federated.industries. Basically, the big thing that we're working on um, is we want to think about how do we decarbonize aviation. Aviation is Hawaii's single largest contribution to the climate crisis. It's something like 34% of our global, uh, of our GHG emissions. Uh, it's also a, a, a thing that we're completely dependent on. You know, we get back and forth on airplanes. Um, and our entire economy is based around, uh, you know, sort of unfortunately, it's based around tourism, which is also obviously aviation dependent. And it's a major source of economic um, risk for us. We spend something like $2.7 billion a year on jet fuel. And that's money that we are basically sending to Libya, to Russia, places that don't necessarily share our values. Uh, and so these are all, you know, big kind of, questions that frame how we're thinking about aviation and about the, the role that we can play in, in climate because uh, aviation is one of those things that is, is regarded as a hard to decarbonize industry. You know, along with, you know, agriculture, um, marine shipping, those are all very difficult to decarbonize because of the, the relative uh, energy capacity of, of batteries versus liquid fuels. Uh, so, our goal is by the end of this decade is to try to decarbonize Hawaii's aviation contribution. Amazing. That's an amazing goal. Um, uh, just a couple of years away, but we can do it. 
Um, we can do it. Yes. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, curious about community ownership and how you see community ownership fitting into the work that Hawaii Federated Industries does. You know, so I, I'm here in Iceland. Um, one thing that I've learned from my conversations with, with the, the, the various companies that we've met with here, they're geothermal, hydroelectric, um, carbon sequestration initiatives and companies is, is the importance of, of, of the fact, well, I guess, you know, the thing that they all share uh, is that they are either owned by the municipalities or owned by the national government. You know, there's, corp there's kind of like sub corporations in the middle, but at the end of the day, these are publicly owned and publicly driven um, projects. And I think what you get with that is a sense of, of community, you know, it, it tends to be sort of more democratic, more centered in what the community you know, wants and needs. And also I think more responsive to the interests of the community. You know, it's something that we've experienced a lot in Hawaii where we see energy projects come in and we see, we see the money flow out, right? And we also see uh, oftentimes, like in the, in the situation in Kuhuku, there's one or two um, turbines that really created anxiety for the community. They asked for there to be relatively minor changes to the way in which those projects, those, those specific turbines were deployed and located. Um, my sense is that the community wasn't really listened to. And I think that if the ownership structure were, were more grounded in the community, I think we might've seen a very different outcome to those, to those situations. So the way that we're focusing on this is to try to build as much local ownership into the, the, the basic corporate structure of Hawaii Federated Industries, or HIFI as we call it, um, just, just to ensure that sort of accountability. And frankly, Ali, you know, um, I'd like to hear about how things are going on Molokai, because your work on Molokai is, is sort of emblematic and illustrative of, of both how we can do community ownership and also why it's so important. So can you share about how things are going there? I would love to, absolutely. Um, yeah, I think I think about community ownership in, in a lot of the same ways that uh, that you just expressed. And, and I think the, the group that uh, we work with on Molokai, the Ho'ahu Energy Cooperative Molokai, uh, is this new entity that has formed just for the explicit reason of um, of owning renewable energy generation. There might be um, uh, other projects on, uh, that the um, co-op might pursue in the future, but for now, we're just talking about this one solar and battery storage project. Um, and I think that uh, and uh, the project would be owned by a newly formed cooperative um, uh, of just residents of Molokai get to be members of this cooperative. And I think that responsiveness that you talked about is exactly uh, one of the benefits of having community ownership because you know nobody else is gonna make these decisions uh, for where the project should go and what it should look like and which kind of solar panels uh, should we buy um, other than the community group itself. Uh, and I think we're still kind of figuring out like what is the format of that decision-making look like? Uh, I think that's that's pretty new to go down to the very technical, like, should we choose this solar panel or that solar panel? And and if it's from this company, should it be this wattage or that wattage? But we found that uh, community members broadly have been super uh, curious and empowered by the idea of uh, understanding what the decisions are to be made and then making those decisions. and. Uh, of course, we have some uh, decisions that don't go like so smoothly uh, that there's some back and forth, there's some discussion and, and trade-offs between decisions. Uh, but I think for the most part, that responsiveness has led us to be able to move pretty quickly over the last year and a half going from project idea to now uh, some uh, support, a, a pretty good amount of uh, financial support and organizational support to be able to do um, a pretty impressive project for the scale of the island, uh, for sure. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, we, we see it, I think, in the energy market in general, that there you, you could be 
a massive, well-funded corporation and still run into problems mm -hmm. getting an energy project delivered. Uh, and we, you know, we see a lot of problems with that right now. I, I think actually there's a greater possibility of these projects coming to fruition with a, with a real community base because it's clear who wants it, mm -hmm. right? The, the, the people of Molokai want this project to be delivered. And so they will demand it. They're going to call you, Ali, when, when, when there's problems. Mm -hmm. They're going to fundraise for it. They're going to hold you know, their, their political leaders uh, responsible and accountable. They're, you know, so that's, it's really important for it to be a demand-driven project. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, sorry. There's one other point that I was trying to make, but uh, why don't you keep talking and I'll... I'm sure yeah, it'll come yeah, out to me. Great. Um, I'll make a little plug here also for uh, anyone listening live um, that might have questions for Ikaika and I on community ownership of uh, clean energy. Uh, email in your questions to questions at thinktechhawaii.com uh, and we will do our best to answer them uh, here in this discussion or we'll have to schedule a, a follow-up session if you ask us any stumper questions. Um, did I give you enough time to think of your uh, other you, point? You now? did, and, and I appreciate that. What I wanted to mention is that we've, I think in Hawaii, we've gotten out of the habit or we sort of lost the, um, the, our knack and, and our, mm -hmm. uh, our familiarity with this sort of community-driven uh, approach. Mm -hmm. It used to be really common for us to do large engineering projects as a community. And what I'm thinking about when I, when I talk about that is, is are, are things that are beyond our lifetimes, but not beyond our memory. So for instance, mm -hmm. um, I grew up in Kaneohe and just up the road in the Kuala Poko area from where I grew up is a Heia fish pond, which, I, you know, it's 2021. I think it's about 800 years old at this point. And that's, that's an example uh, but only one of many of, of these examples of Hawaiians coming together to do incredible engineering projects and to do it collectively. You know, a few years ago, there was a, a there was a, a community work day where the organizers of Pai Pai Ohe'ia asked for volunteers to come to Pani Kapuga to close the hole. There was a gap in the in the hole in, in the wall in the fish pond. And it was a beautiful day. There were hundreds of people all carrying stones, you know, and the stones were different sizes, different size people can have different size stones. Uh, but to see everyone come together, it reminded me, I think, of, of something that was probably a much more common sight back in the day, back in the day when we were, um, you know, just a little bit more self-governing, a little bit more self-sustaining, where we recognize that our future lies in each other. It's not about money. It's not about even technology. It's actually about us as a people working together. And so the, these efforts are going to take, you know, there, there's, there's going to be some tripping up. Uh, you know, we're going to make some mistakes. We're going to learn from those mistakes. But ultimately, it's about building a stronger community. And that's the key, I think, for us um, fundamentally of, of dealing with this massive transition in order to, to um, deal with confront and ultimately re reverse the climate crisis. I mean, for, for HiFi, that's really our goal is, you know, we think of it as kind of a, a threefold thing. It's to reverse climate change primarily, and then to also strengthen and make our island economies more circular and then create good local jobs because we need, you know, fundamentally more healthy economy or more healthy society. Mm. Mm hmm mm hmm um, I'm curious, uh, in prepping for this session, I thought of three specific pros of uh, community ownership, um, uh, and I want to uh, read them, well, list them to you and, and hear if you have any others to add to that or any uh, nuances there. Um, the first one is kind of the one that we've just been talking about, that responsiveness, the like community members have better knowledge to build better projects that are uh, use our resources better. Uh, they're they're um, uh, and and they kind of they solve the problem. They 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 fill the puka way better than somebody externally could, I believe. Uh, and I think we're mm -hmm. we're proving that out. 
So one is better projects because we have better local knowledge. The other one is um, uh, better, like more equitable decision making because the, the person who financially owns the project gets to decide who do we hire, where does it go, what does it look mm. like, where do we source our equipment from. Um, which historically, a lot of those decisions can have reverberating effects in a community. And so if the local community is deciding who gets hired, we can hire more locally. Um, and so the decision making is really important um, uh, about where we build things. And then as well, the last one uh, that I think is really important is the wealth creation and kind of distributing yeah. right now uh, our big companies that are that are. Um, owned by maybe a few individuals uh, that have kind of have uh, centralized the wealth in in a few individuals and I think community ownership can be that great way of distributing uh, collective wealth is um, across a community and keep retain that wealth that like uh, uh, incremental amount of money that a community otherwise might have paid that got extracted uh, to a bigger company outside of the community, it kind of uh, uh, remains circular in the community and helps build that wealth and keep that wealth locally. Um, yeah. Do you have any uh, additions to that or like nuances there or do you not agree with any of those? Uh, I make it a habit of agreeing with the host of any talk show that I'm on. <laughs> <laughs> but but seriously, you know, the um, you know, these projects wouldn't happen. There wouldn't be so much uh, external interest in doing energy projects in Hawaii unless it were a good business, right? Mm -hmm. That's 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 how we um, that's the only way to understand, I think, what's going on. And so it makes sense for those projects to be uh, to be benefiting local people. Fundamentally, it has to benefit our our, our community, or or we got to change the you know the way that we're doing these things. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Great, I love to be agreed with. Um, I'm uh, curious about um, hi-fi. Uh, I know that uh, you have expressed to me in the past an interest in you know community ownership of not just the projects that you guys create, but of uh, your company as well. Um, how are you thinking right. about that? And like, what do you think the benefits of that are? Well, you know, the benefit is, um, is, is, a, is just about alignment. Uh, you know, I come out of a community organizing background. And so for me, being aligned with, with my community is, it's the only way that, that I can sleep at night. You know, it just, it keeps things copacetic and it feels pono if it's grounded in our community. So that's the benefit of it. Uh, I, the, the, way to, the way to do that is to structure the finances of the company such that the, the owners are the folks you know, around us, um, our friends and families, our you know, the, the soccer coaches and the, you know, the ministers and, and just our neighbors. That's, that's who should be uh, controlling and, and driving, frankly, the direction of our work. Um, it just seems to be the most consistent way to do it. Yeah. And, and you know, if you want, I can expound a little bit more about kind of what I'm imagining for the future of, you know, obviously, so we're starting with a really tough project, right? We're starting with this thing that's like a, it's a decade long um, project. Uh, we do have a few other things that we're, that we're thinking about working on. And we mentioned them on our website a little bit. We're, we're looking at some opportunities with regards to, the invasive eucalyptus um, uh, plantation that was planted in the Hamakua coast about 20 years ago, I believe. And you know, we're, we're, we're trying to figure out a strategy that would allow for the community in Hamakua on the big island, um, uh, not, not Hamakua on, on Oahu, to, to begin to kind of reposition their natural resources away from a plantation system, you know, previously with sugar, now it's eucalyptus, to something which is more regenerative, more based on on native trees and native plants, and more about kind of uh, feeding the economic needs of the community directly. So, the, I'm sorry, economic and also cultural, you know, needs. Uh, so we're looking at different products that can be made out of the eucalyptus. And so we're doing a couple of what we're calling R and D projects, just straight up research and development, looking at 
for instance, biochar, which is uh, a way of uh, basically uh, paralyzing a, um, some biomass or, or a tree and turning it into a carbon neutral or even a carbon negative uh, soil additive, uh, basically burying the carbon in the soil. So we're looking at doing biochar. We're also investigating and, and researching and developing um, different kinds of furniture or, or building materials that can be manufactured from eucalyptus with the goal of essentially monetizing the biomass and, uh, and allowing for the land to be returned to native forestry and to regenerative agriculture. So that's, that's another project that we're working on for Hamakur. Amazing. Um, that is awesome. Uh, when you think about a specific project like that in a specific area, do you think about uh, uh, Hi-Fi um, uh, as like a broadly community-owned company across the state of Hawaii that then owns uh, a project uh, on Big Island, owns a project on uh, Oahu, or do you think about it more locally uh, in terms of like uh, the folks who live in Hamakua owning that project and the folks who live on the Kona side owning a different project? How do you, how do you think about that? I guess the way that I think about it is, you know, I, I take the word federated. I, I think that it's a fun word for me. Uh, what, what I'm imagining is that if, if we can uh, accomplish our goals with the R&D, like that's a big if, mm -hmm. and I don't want to oversell it. You know, we are, we, our goal is to do essentially scientific research to figure out, can we make a useful product um, mm -hmm. in, in, in terms of biochar and building materials, et cetera. But once that's, you know, if we can prove it out, then that becomes a little business that can be structured as a cooperative, like a formal workers cooperative, or just as a more generally, you know, small business with, with employees, et cetera. But that entity, you know, would hire, it would have its own group of people that, that work with or work for that group. Um, and it would generate livelihoods for those people in, you know, wherever they are. And if they're in Hamakua, then, then it is to the benefit of the people of Hamakua. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think that is a really cool, uh, I, I think about community ownership sometimes like at, at, the, at a wide scale, like a national government is also community ownership in, in a way. Yeah. Um, but sure. sometimes like the, the farther away, the many levels between the individual person who gets to give input on a project and the powers that be, um, somewhere in that power structure, sometimes uh, the like responsiveness gets lost and, and the distribution of wealth uh, equally gets lost. Uh, and yeah. I think that what you are describing is a good way of kind of like layering uh, co-ops uh, to, to yeah. keep that responsiveness. I mean, one, one, way we're, one way that we've been thinking about doing it in Hamakua, and it depends, frankly, on whether we can prove out the numbers. Um, so that is an if. I, I, I don't want to, you know, I want to be kind of real about that, mm -hmm. is if it does prove to be uh, a good revenue source to do biochar, for instance, then we, we've been thinking about essentially building what we're calling like a permanent fund, um, kind of like with Alaska, you know, the, there's the oil revenue from the Alaskan oil wells, which go into a permanent fund, which then benefits the people of Alaska on a sort of perpetual basis, you know, it's an endowment. Um, we're thinking about doing something like that for Hamakua, because really what, what that community needs and what I think a lot of our communities that are going through an economic transition need is a dependable source of revenue that can fund the future changes that, you know, whether that's planting native trees, you know, uh, doing more energy projects, um, you know, uh, supporting cultural and educational programs, raising up new new generations of young leaders. These are all things which require funding. And, you know, there's this interesting opportunity with um, lots of, of a particular, <laughs> of, of, of a thing that, that people don't want anymore, mm -hmm. which in this case is the eucalyptus. If we can essentially convert that into a usable material that also has financial value and use that that financial value to endow you know the perpetual perpetual fund i i just think it's a very interesting um, opportunity 
whether it's financially, uh, whether it actually works, is something that we're that we're you know examining right now through the R and D process, mm. and I'm and I'm hoping that it does. Mm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think that endowment idea is such a powerful one from a community perspective, because we're talking about communities who have been historically disinvested for like decades to centuries yeah. to probably longer than that, and one of the biggest hurdles for the Molokai project that we have to get over is if our project costs several million dollars, uh, where are we going to get that several million dollars? There's there, right. there uh, um, is not just, you know, $20 million hanging out uh, in a disinvested community just waiting for a project like this to come around. Um, and so to create uh, uh, a fund that could support other community owned projects that are maybe harder to uh, capitalize, uh, what a powerful thing. Yeah, I, I think it is too. You know, it's, it's, we're in this crazy economy where ultimately the only thing you need is money. And um, I've always believed that actually people are more important than, than, than money. And mm-hmm. if, if we can organize our communities so that we can, you know, transform the relationship to capital, you know, where the people are more important than capital, then, then that's the economy that I want to build. Uh, I, I just think that's so much better. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, we've got just a couple of minutes left. Um, uh, do you have any closing thoughts you want to share with our audience or things we should ponder for next time? Well, you know, actually, Ali, can you share kind of what are the next steps with Molokai? You know, uh, mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah, yeah, I would love to. Uh, so we just uh, um, found um, some news out a couple of weeks ago that we're, uh, looks like we're aiming for a February due date for our proposal to the utility for this community owned solar plus storage uh, mm-hmm. CBRE project. Uh, so we're kind of ramping up uh, to, to put in all of our deliverables and make sure that we have commitment for financing um, uh, for that project and have a clear picture of where it's gonna go and and what the engineering diagrams look like. Uh, There's a pretty heavy lift between uh, now and then. Uh, We've got four, three meetings left before the end of the year. And then in January, we'll kind of be tying up loose ends with the community group about uh, the subscription model and um, the precise layout. Um, and then, and then once we submit that proposal, we kind of wait for six months, uh, while working on, uh, to hear whether we get the contract from the utility and then we get to move along there. Uh, and then we're off to new projects like microgrids and, uh, workforce development training and all sorts of other, uh, programs that they're really excited about. That's great. I'm really glad to hear about the progress that Molokai is making. Yeah, it's really, you know, you guys are setting the the course that I think a lot of us can follow behind. Mahalo. Well, thank you. Um, and mahalo for joining me again at 2 a.m. from Iceland. Uh, you are a champion. Um, I really appreciate it. And I look forward to chatting more about community ownership uh, in the future. We'll have to have you back on. Sounds good. Thanks so much, Allie. Thanks, Think Tech. Yeah, thanks.